And so Geppetto, he's a good guy. He has a kitten. You know, the kitten likes him. He makes puppets. And he's a humble person. And he knows that compared to the ideal that he's attempting to subscribe to, that he's, he's not abased before it or anything like that. He's not despicable in relationship to it. But the reason he's on his knees is because the thing he's pointing at is above him. You know, if he... he it, it wouldn't be the right aim if it wasn't above him. And so the fact that he's on his knees, so to speak, is only an indication that his aim is proper because you should be on your knees to something that you actually admire. And if you don't feel like being on your knees in front of it, then perhaps you don't actually admire it. And then that means you haven't got the stage set properly. It, could be, it should be something that fills you with awe. Your aim should, should be at something that fills you with awe. Because what else, why, why do something else? Well, perhaps because it's easy and perhaps because it's malevolent and all of those things. But, but those are no answer to the problems that beset you. They just make things worse, and that's clear. And so then Geppetto, have his, having made his pact, his covenant, just like Abraham, he falls into a dream, right? He falls into a dream, and the rest of the movie actually takes place in a dream. And it's a dream, it's the dream within which transformation takes place. And that's laid out at least in part. Time stops in, in, in the Pinocchio story. And everything happens to Pinocchio in some sense in a land that's outside of normal time. And that's, that's the infinite archetypal space. And that's a real place. That's a real place. The infinite and the finite coexist. And most of the time, we're in the place of the finite. But that doesn't mean that the place of the infinite doesn't exist. It just means that we can't get access to it. We just get intimations of it from time to time. You know, when things are going perfectly well for you, on those rare occasions where everything comes together for the brief moment you inhabit that divine place and you have some sense of what your life could be like if you organized it from the smallest element to the largest element. And that's a place that you can inhabit, if not forever, in a manner that at least felt like forever. Well, because of... Geppetto's decision, the transcendent manifests itself. It takes the form of the blue fairy. Here, that's the positive element of nature, right? So we could say, well, nature, it's not so clear that she's on your side, right? She's the red queen in Alice in Wonderland who runs around screaming when you go down the rabbit hole. She runs around screaming off with her heads and who says, in my kingdom, you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. That's Mother Nature. But then we might say, well, how do we know that Mother Nature's attitude towards you isn't negative because your attitude towards things isn't proper? And that's what this film attempts to indicate. The idea is that if you aim properly, then nature aligns itself behind you. Now, it also arrays itself in front of you, perhaps even as an antagonist, but the power that it, it, it provides you with from within might be sufficient to overcome it from without. And I think that I think that the clinical evidence is clear about that. Because one of the things that we do know is that if you take people who are confronting terrible things and shrinking from them, and you teach them how to structure their behavior so that they can advance with courage, everything works better for them their fears decrease, and their character grows. And so there might be enough of nature within us to help us withstand the nature that's outside of us. And it depends at least to some degree on how it is that we orient ourselves in the world to some, in, to, to some unknowable degree. Now, Geppetto wants an autonomous individual as a son. And that's also something that makes him a great person because autonomous individuals have their own will and if you're a tyrant it's the last thing that you're going to want and if you're the tyrant who's jealous of his son it's even more so the last thing you're ever going to want and so to aim high and to want the development of the autonomous individual are the same thing and I would say that's the core story in some sense of, the, of Western culture is that to aim high and to develop the autonomous individual are the same thing. And that's what happens in Pinocchio. That's what happens in the story of Abraham. And the transformation takes place. The magical transformation. 
And in the Pinocchio story, one of the things that's so interesting about it, and it, this is part of its mythological substructure, from the scientific perspective, there's only two determining forces with regards to the destiny of the individual. There's nature, deterministic, and culture, deterministic. And then scholars wrangle about which of those is the greater force. But in mythological stories, there's always a third element. And that third element is something like autonomous consciousness. And there's no place for autonomous consciousness in the deterministic story of nature and culture. But we all act as if autonomous consciousness is the primary reality. And the biblical stories are predicated on the idea that autonomous consciousness is what gives rise to the world. And I don't think that we're in a position to presume that that is necessarily in error. And so what that means is to aim high and to develop the autonomous individual is, is simultaneously the decision to formulate an allegiance with the, the conscious power that brings being into existence. And that all takes place inside this little puppet. And then he has his adventures, right? He's, he's, he's still half jackass and half deceptive, but he's still, despite that, and despite all the errors, he has the capacity to move forward and to transform him into something, to transform himself into something that can be properly considered, described as a true son of God. And that's the right aim. And it works like this, as far as I can tell, you know. When I talk to people about doing the future authoring program, they often put it off. And it's not surprising, because it's hard. And, and be it, but it's more than that. They think, well, I don't know how to write. I'm going to do a bad job. I don't really like assignments. I'm going to have to do it perfectly. I need to wait till I have enough time. And like one of those is enough to stop you cold, and all five of them, you're just done. And so I tell people, do it haphazardly, a tiny bit at a time, and badly, because you can do that. I tell my students when they're doing their thesis, master's thesis, write a really bad first draft. And then we have a little conversation about that, because they don't think I mean that. Because it sounds like a cliche in some sense. It's not a cliche. It's not a cliche at all. It means you're a terrible writer, but, but if someone put a gun to your head and said, you have to have your 100-page thesis done by next Monday, or I'll shoot you, but I don't care how terrible it is, you would sit down and write it. And the thing is, then you have it, right? Then, then you have something, and then you can fix it. You can iterate and fix it. That bad first draft, that's the most valuable thing, and so that's what you need. You need a bad first draft of yourself. And there's, there's an idea that Jung developed about the trickster and the jester, the comedian, right? That the, the trickster is the precursor to the savior. That's one of the things I learned from Jung that was just, it's so unlikely. You'd never think that. It's so amazing that that might be the case. But the, 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 sat the satirical and the ironic and the, and the troublemaker, the, the comedian, the fool, the fool is the precursor to the savior. Why? Because you're a fool when you start something new. And so if you're not willing to be a fool, then you'll never start anything new. And if you never start anything new, then you won't develop. And so the willingness to be a fool is the precursor to transformation. And that's the same as humility. And so if you're going to write your destiny, you can do a bad first job. You're going to get smarter as you move forward. That's the thing is that so something beckons to you. That's what happens here. Maybe the star that Geppetto wished on was the wrong damn star. But at least it was a star, right? At least it was in the sky. At least it moved him forward. And so you say in your life, well, something grips you and, and, and fills you with interest. And you think, well, should I do that? And the answer is, if not that, then something. What if it's a mistake? It's a mistake. Rest assured. What do you know? You're going to stumble around, right? And what's going to happen is this. You're going to move. To, you're going to not stay in stasis. You're not going to wander around in circles. And I see people like that. They said, well, I never knew what to do, and now I'm 40. 